this deck of slides is a resource pack and you're going to find that the links to everything are here. So don't bother to write it down anything that is in any of the slides um, that you will be able to get. But if you have any questions or if I'm not being clear enough about anything, please do ask me. Um, I trust my slides are up, so if anything goes wrong, just let me know. It's very important that I say to you at the beginning of this that I'm not a, a lawyer. I've done the Creative Commons Certificate course, and I'm one of the training facilitators on the certificate course. And I'd encourage everybody to do it. But I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not giving you legal advice. If you need legal advice, you have to appoint a lawyer, and of course pay them, and then they would probably be able to give you some legal advice. What we're talking about today is a very narrow field of the copyright law, and it's not copyright in general. So I'm just going to stick to that very narrow band and, um, and just that part. And I think that's the part that really would interest you in the work that you're doing. Why am I involved in this? Um, well, I think with the OER movement, and I was part of this before there was an OER movement, and um, I think it's to try to equalize things around the world. This isn't just a South African problem, or since we have a colleague in India, an Indian problem. Um, this is a problem in all countries around the world. The wealthiest countries have a disparity problem as well. So maybe OER can contribute a little bit towards that. It's important, I think, that we uh, are clear that this didn't start with, um, o with the UNESCO deciding that um, OER would be the thing in 2002. It has a longer history than that. So I drew this little diagram to give some indication because various people come at this from different, different angles. And so um, they always say that their own angle is the, the right one. So at the top on the left-hand side, uh, you'd remember that in the decades past, we've been sharing materials. We've just been making photocopies on machines. We've been duplicating. Once the internet arrived, we started emailing things around. So we've been sharing, whether it's legal or not is a different thing. Then of course, David Wiley's name pops up in about the 90s, especially the late 90s, because he's the person who wrote the first, the first open license. It was a, an open content license. And the name that's going to keep coming up is the Hewlett Foundation. It's the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. If they hadn't funded this whole movement, there wouldn't be a movement. I know because I was there. Moving to the middle part of this, the open source world, a completely different world of people started forming, as far as I can tell, in about the 80s. And um, they started writing software and sharing software. I remember seeing that on, on floppy disks in the, uh, in the 80s. So you get things like the Free Software Foundation and the GNU project um, come from those days. And of course, then Linux. Um, the name Richard Stallman will keep coming up, and a person named Linus Torvalds. This is the person who created Linux, as far as I know, and he still runs most of the show with that. So that whole movement came into this thinking as well. People were thinking open source software, or FOSS, long before they were thinking about OER. The bottom part of this is what you would hear if you listen to the Creative Commons team. Um, Creative Commons has its origin in a person named Larry Lessig in the late 90s who found out that um, the laws were about to be changed in the US and I'm going to come back and tell you a little bit more about that later but that's the last part of this that um, is important to take note of. On the right hand side where this starts to become the OER movement is in around 2000 a person named Susan D'Antoni was running online discussions at UNESCO she was a Canadian based in, in Paris at the time. And so this discussion was moving forwards from about 2000, 2001. And in, I think it was 2001, some meeting, one of those online meetings came up with this idea that it should be called OER. And that was um, after various people like David Wiley and others had pitched their various names and um, that this name was agreed on by consensus of normal everyday people. It wasn't done by heads of government. I fast forward now to 2007. There was a meeting in Cape Town. Fortunately for me, I was there um, representing the Commonwealth of Learning, which is based in Vancouver in Canada. Uh, at that meeting, we created a document which you can find online. You just have to search for it if you haven't looked at it yet. 
and thousands of people eventually signed up to support the, the notion that people should be doing something about this. From 2007, we fast forward another five years where Sir John Daniel, who was still then the president and CEO of the Commonwealth of Learning, ran the first OER declaration meeting in Paris with UNESCO. And it's good to get UNESCO involved because that's your connection to all the governments. Around 2016-17, the Commonwealth of Learning ran workshops in all parts of the world. It was um, uh, consultation workshops. Fortunately for me, again, I was working in London at the Commonwealth Secretariat at that time, and I managed to attend the meeting that was held for Europe, which was in Malta. Um, these meetings around the world gelled the, the notion that there should be something stronger said by UNESCO to all the governments. And that culminated in a 2019 meeting, firstly of senior officials, and then later of heads of government. There are some stories about what happened in the senior officials meeting. The wording got changed a bit from the globally um, consulted wording, but it's okay. We know what was changed and we know what happened to it. I'm going to, there we go. And the same story in a different format. You can take a look at this once you get the slides. And I'm just recognizing at the bottom the Hewlett Foundation. Without them, this wouldn't have happened. So I'm not going to go through this, this in, in high speed. So I'm not going to be reading the slides. You can look at them later. The whole copyright thing comes from a few hundred years ago. And it was vested in the world of print. But what has happened since then is we've been moving from print, which was very expensive, to digital, which is normal zero cost. And we can now share at a far higher scale than ever before. But of course, many people have based their business models on this very controlled print world. And so there's a lot of tension about trying to convert them through to various digital models. And there are a lot of possible digital models. So let's move on. We need to share resources. We need to improve things. Just touching on the uh, origins for Creative Commons sites, since I am speaking on behalf of the Creative Commons movement as well, the so-called Mickey Mouse Protection Act is actually the um, Sunny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act in the US when the government there wanted to move the term of copyright from you have the, the life of the author, then they pass away, and then copyright extends for another 50 years. And they were at that time moving it to 70 years. And that's where Lawrence Lessig got, got into it with um, a person who wanted to oppose this and to stop them from increasing it by yet another 20 years. The, the um, act that was coming into being just happened to be in time with one of the, the Disney um, plays of the, that I think it's called Showboat that was about to go into the public domain and they were trying to stop it. They did not manage to stop it, but um, they have raised a lot of uh, attention to this, these problems. If something stays in total copyright forever, it means that we can't build on it, we can't get creative with it. So Larry Lessig then decided to create this Creative Commons movement in 2001, just the same year that I moved to Vancouver to work with the Commonwealth of Learning. And the first licenses were issued in 2002, which is, I believe, when I went to a Hewlett meeting and I listened to Larry Lessig for the first time. I went back to Canada to Commonwealth of Learning after that, and I said to everybody, I think this is a great idea. We should be doing this because, of course, it would help all the Commonwealth countries and beyond. There are, by the way, 54 Commonwealth countries around the world, many of them in Africa. What Creative Commons is, and this, is, this would overlap with what you already know, so I might be giving you a little bit of repetition here. There are six free licenses. The licenses themselves are not open to adaptation. They were written by a set of lawyers around the world. We are up to version four now. And these licenses are available to anybody around the world. They were written by lawyers, including in South Africa. There was a massive um, collaborative venture to, uh, to write these licenses. And I'm gonna be going into more detail on that. So although this started in the US, it's not a set of American licenses. Honestly, it's not. 
So the, the Creative Commons staff are not on staff with Creative Commons. They are based around the world. There is no central office for the, for the organization. The licenses are used by many organizations. I just popped a couple here. Many of them are the art galleries. There are many repositories. You've got a repository. So many people use them, including organizations like UNESCO and the World Bank. If you go to the copyright page, just beyond the title page of most, if not all of their reports these days, you'll find that they are copyright reserved and then released under a Creative Commons license. And Siavula is a Cape Town based organization originally funded by the Shuttleworth Foundation and um, it releases all its material under one of the copyright licenses that Creative Commons issues. I'll, I'll try to touch on that later. If I don't, if I forget it, please do remind me later on. Um, I've mentioned Creative Commons and the movement is now the activists and policy makers and researchers around the world and of course it includes all of, all of you. So that's wonderful. Um, there is a global network and I encourage you to join it. Uh, it's the Creative Commons Global Network that's free to join. There's also, of course, the South African chapter, which is free to join as well. No formalities involved. At the moment, there are about 2 billion works that, are, that carry the Creative Commons licenses on around 9 million websites. So nobody can say to you it's on the fringes anymore. This is quite a big thing. And the focus is on openness, collaboration, and trying to share human creativity. And anybody can use it just by using the logos on the materials. Um, so we now can share around the world. Um, I dropped in the definition of OER from UNESCO. There are many definitions, starting with the original one would have been the Hewlett Foundation one, which still stands. You'll find it on their website. Um, I think it's important to always come back to it's uh, there's public domain which i'll touch on and then there are the open licenses but for oer specifically only some of the licenses will will um, work for them and you must be able to use adapt and distribute and in this case if you can't distribute it then the adaptation is is not useful enough so i'm going to touch on that as we go through over and over this is an adaptation that I've created. The left-hand part is what uh, Cable, Green's has Cable Green has used in his presentation. The right-hand part with the colored arrows is what I've been adding to this. You have this range of six licenses plus public domain. At the very top, it's the most freedom. So it's public domain, you don't give attribution even. It's nice if you do, but you don't have to. Then you have the six licenses starting from CC BY all the way through to the most restrictive license at the bottom is CC um, non-commercial and no derivatives. Those last two are generally not considered OER, but they are considered open access. So you can share a textbook or something else like that as a no derivative, and it's still okay to call it open access, but there are specific ones for the OER that you can look at the green arrow, and if you bump into anybody in the free cultural works uh, world, they will only accept the top three, that's public domain plus two licenses. The same thing drawn in a different way because we all like to see things differently. The most restrictive set of licenses, um, the smallest group of licenses, I should say, are the free cultural in the smallest bubble. And the bigger bubble there is all the open educational resources licenses added onto that. And then in the biggest bubble of all is including the non-commercial, sorry, the, the no derivatives and the all rights reserved in certain cases. So if an all rights reserved uh, ar article or document is on the internet and it says you may still use this under these conditions, it still falls into open access. I don't want to draw your attention to the bottom right hand side where it says public domain. I draw, I have drawn this, this uh, diagram, but I decided to put a public domain sticker onto it rather than to say, please recognize me every time you use it. Um, I'm giving it out free to the world. So this is an example of taking something and dropping it straight into the public domain. You don't have to recognize me for it, but you could. Um, on the slide, you'll also find a link, and that is a link to a, an article 
a blog that I published under the Creative Commons websites blogs. Let's start going into the next level of detail. You'll hear from David Wiley's always um, mentioned with the five R's. It's retain, revise, remix, reuse, and redistribute. So it's important that we always do this or can do this with OER. If, you, if there's certain ones not there, it may still be an open access, but it might not be called an OER. It's just a technical difference, no major issue with it. So retain, I must be able to keep it on my computer. If, for example, you've done something, created something, I download it, but you say to me, you can read it on screen, but you can't download it to your computer, that's not then a retention. Uh, I can't retain it. So it's not useful to me if I can't retain it. It has some use to read it online. It's open, but it's not an OER. Revise. If I can't adapt it, then I can't call it an OER. Now with, I'm going to touch on the, the um, no derivatives again. There's a bit of a funny with the licenses and the, the no derivatives. So just remember that for later. Normally for OER, you must be able to adapt it and share it. So it's adapt and share. Remix, I must be able to take original sources, bring them together and mix them up. And there are uh, guidelines for what you can mix with what as well and how to do that. To reuse, um, to be able to carry on reusing the thing and to redistribute, I must be able to share it on. The license cannot say to me, you can use it, but you can't share it on. The 29 recommendations on OER uh, eventually given out by UNESCO You'll find somewhere on this page is a link to, to the license, is to the um, recommendations. Be careful of the warnings. There's a list of warnings there. There's a link. Those are by David Wiley, the opencontent.org site. They need to include the five R's. Um, within your institution, you need to start to look at a, an OER policy. I have a feeling you do have an OER policy. I think I've used it before. Um, but there's a note that I've linked to there as well um, as part of a report that I'll mention at the end of the presentation. So there are, there are various guidelines that you can use to help you to, um, to create or to update an OER policy. And that hopefully you do for the whole institution within uh, ways to adapt it if needed. Let's move on. So once we've created a, an OER, we need to think about some technical aspects of this OER. If I've created an OER, I've created, let's say, a learning module, and I put it online and you download it, it would not be very helpful if that OER caused you to spend another 20,000 or 30,000 Rand. Um, sorry, I don't know what that is in Indian rupees. Um, sounds a lot more in rupees, though, I think. Um, it would be useless if you had to spend an absolute fortune buying the tools to be able to edit the item that I've given you. In this case, I'm going to give you a PDF, which you can say, well, I'm not really giving you the editable version. So you can always email me and say, can you have that? And I'll give you the PowerPoint. Then you might say to me, but I can't afford to buy a PowerPoint or MS Office, in which case I would save it as an open office and give, it, give you open office and I would give you a link to where to download OpenOffice. So I would try to make this as accessible to you as possible. So if you cannot afford it, I'm gonna to try to make it affordable, as, as affordable as possible. The level of expertise required. If, for example, I used a very um, complicated graphics program to create something and it, you had to go on a course for six months, I would also be putting out barriers that are just not helpful to you. So I need to try to keep my technology as standard as possible so that other people can honestly use the material that I'm giving out. Meaningfully editable. Am I giving you just a scan picture um, when you receive these slides? They are, in fact, just like that. But as I say, if you, if you want the editable versions, you can ask me and I will then give those to you. Or is it in some funny format that nobody actually uses? Or is it in one of the major formats that we do use. We need to try to make things as accessible as possible. As academics, when you create materials and you need to give it a license, you probably will have a guideline from your university to say, in the first instance, use this license. 
And if that doesn't work for you because of some reason, then this is the process for using a different license. If in your personal life you need to select a license, there are two um, links at the bottom of the slide where you can use the tools on the Creative Commons site to help you to choose which license you want. So you answer the questions in plain English and it'll say to you, based on your answers, this is the license that you want to, um, that you should be using. That's what you feel like using. Once it's done that for you, you're going to be given a page with the license. And the one that you're going to use mostly would be the so-called human readable one in the middle. And that one is the simple one that says this is a Creative Commons license. It's with attribution or BY's by attribution. And it's maybe a share alike or something else. The lawyer readable one is that half a dozen page document of fine print, which you probably won't read, just like most of us when we install software, whoever gets to read all of this code because you're going to click on it and move on. In this world, if you're using the Creative Commons license, at least you're in good company of, of many millions of people around the world using them. If you go to another kind of license, if you have an XYZ license off a website that gives graphics out, you're on your own. You need to read that full lawyer readable version of the contract, understand what it says to you, and make sure that you are not breaching copyright somewhere. Because if you are, it could cost an awful lot of money. And there are some horrible stories coming out about predators who go on online, require an absolutely precise version of an attribution statement. And when you don't do it, they send you a bill for tens of thousands of dollars, US. The last version at the bottom here is the computer readable one. This is stuck in the metadata of the material. And hopefully it's what Google picks up. And when you do a search on Google, this is what helps you to find the right material. A lot of the time we don't do it, of course, and um, it makes it more difficult to find the uh, shareable materials. But those are the three levels of every license. Now I'm going to go into the most detail probably of the whole presentation. I'm going to describe each of these ones. You can get more detail on the website, but I hope that you'll have an overview in a couple of minutes. So the first one, by attribution or with attribution, in all of the Creative Commons licenses, you should see that when you download and use the work, you should be giving attribution. And there is a, a, a syntax or a format or a template of how to give that attribution. It's not the same as a citation. You still need to do your citation, but where you are using this, this item, this um, work, you need to give it an attribution as well. So that's just giving recognition to the original author. And if you adapt the work and you then share it on, the next person needs to attribute you and the person who gave, it, gave the work to you. So you may find that you end up with a page full of attributions on something as well. Share alike requests you to share on this work under the same, same kind of license if you adapt it. But my words there were, if you adapt it. If you have not adapted the work, Share alike doesn't apply. So if you download the lecture notes that I've produced, which I haven't, this is just an example, um, and you adapt those, then I'm asking you to please put it onto your web server without a firewall or paywall and share it on with others just the way that I gave it to you. And the reason for that is so that we try to multiply the value of this item. If I've invested time and energy, or more so if I've been paid to produce something, then hopefully it just should be replicated around the world as many times as possible. The non-commercial is, in my mind, I usually suggest that this probably means a non-profit because non-commercial does not mean that money cannot change hands. An easy example to use for this is rather in the old physical world. If let's say I had downloaded a module and I had a classroom of people. COVID hadn't happened. They were sitting there waiting for me and I, I needed to hand out this thing in a classroom. And under uh, fair, what have we got? Fair use and fair, I'll think of that one. Um, I, can, I can take this material, I can go to the photocopier and I can copy it. 
and I can hand it out. And I can say to all my students in the classroom, please pay me 10 Rand for the copies or 100 Rand, whatever it is. If I needed to pay somebody else to stand at the photocopy and do this for me, I could pay them as well. And I could include that in the amount of money that I'm being reimbursed by students. None of that is considered commercial gain because I'm not commercially gained from anything. I'm purely recovering the costs. So it means that you can even go to a uh, postnet and you can take the material to a postnet, print it there, pay them, and you can recover that money from your students. That has been shown by um, precedent in the US as well. So it's not that. And it also means that a publishing company can take an NC work, use it, and actually recover costs. But I didn't use the word profit from it and I didn't use the word sell. So it does not preclude a, a for-profit company, even a listed company, from using a work that is licensed as NC. What they might need to do is use some clever accounting so that they can ring fence this particular project um, and so that they can make sure that they don't generate profit on it or move profit to another organization or to another cost center in their business. It also applies to a non-profit organization. If a non-profit organization is generating a surplus by using the material and then transferring that surplus to another project, that would also be a commercial gain. And that probably wouldn't succeed in uh, defending that in law. So it's, it's an area to just be cautious of. <clears throat> There's a whole world of people who hate the non-commercial clause being there. If you need it, you need it. If you can do without it, that's great. But I always say, if I generate, if I was to generate something that I thought was of value and I put a non-commercial clause on it, if somebody said to me, sends me an email to say, I wanna use this, I'm gonna make lots of money, what, what must I do? I'd say, just share a little bit of money with me as well and then you can do it. You can always write to the owner of the material and ask them about the material. And most people I think would, would uh, respond to you. The last of these, the one that I said would be excluded from OER, but is still open, is the no derivative. What you're allowed to do with a no derivative is if you download a report, you can adapt it for yourself, but you're not allowed to share it. That's a bit of a tweak in the contract. It's in the newer versions of the, of the license. So it's something to be cautious of if somebody says, but you can adapt a no derivative work. Yes, you can for your own purposes but not for other people. The other changes that you can make in a no derivative work is for example, you could translate it into braille to make it more accessible or translate it into another language. That's not making a change to it, that's adding value to it. The other thing is you might find that the spelling varies. It might be in American and you want South African English spelling, for example. So you would want to change um, spelling or correct some, some spelling issues. So that's, those are the, the, um, the terms or what, what are called the restrictions. Each of these is a different restriction and they come together to form the six licenses. So I'm gonna to touch on the public domain. Um, this is the public domain that if a work is copyrighted, and it goes through its whole thing of the life of the author and then 50 years or 70 years or whatever applies in whichever country, it then enters the public domain in which, at which point you no longer even have to give an attribution to the, to the original author. You can customize and use it, but it's, it's better, it's, it's more polite to give an attribution even if it is in the public domain, if you can. Um, the, the term of when it converts into the public domain, that depends, it varies from country to country. And remember that the uh, applicable law is the law in the country where this is going to be used. Now, since you're working online, you probably have students in various other countries. So it's not South African law that is going to apply here. It might be the Botswana law or the Nigerian law. And if you are going to be getting too close to the edge of using a copyrighted material when it might not be in copyright anymore, you would need to check country by country. So you need to be very careful with those. Um, and certain works would fall outside of the scope of copyright. Um, typically this is a government gazette, things issued by the government, 
or something like that drawing that I showed you earlier, where I just decided to pop it straight into the into the uh, public domain. Creative Commons created two icons for this, or two little logos. One is CC0, and the other one is a public domain marker. They're not actually licenses, although they very often are called that. They are just markers. So this also gives you a way to say to other people, this is free to use, go for it. There's a link there which gives you public domain equivalent licenses if you want to learn a little bit more about that. Um, I think I've said enough about this. There's another link there that you can take a look at. And these are the, are the public domain markers. So you can use those if you don't need to hold back copyright on something. And if you're not even looking for attribution. Take care. <clears throat> so these are the warnings. License proliferation. A few years ago, somebody asked me to write a new open license for them. I said, why? And they said to me, well, we want to change it. This Creative Commons license isn't quite what we want. Now, you will find a few odd licenses around, like there's a, an international agency license by, Co by Creative Commons from the early days. It's not issued anymore. It's now a bit dated. So you will find some Creative Commons licenses. And there was a time when there were country by country licenses, but I was one of the people that said to them, this is insane. How can you have licenses country by country when materials are, are darting around the world so fast? Those aren't the ones I'm worried about. The ones I'm worried about are when a license comes up as ABC license, open license, and it says, this is a shareable license and you can, you can use the material. But what the user doesn't do, what you and I don't do then, is to read all the detail of the copyright license. If you go to a website with some graphics or pictures on it, and it says they've got their own license, shareable license, you had better download the detailed lawyer readable version and read the whole thing. Because in it, it may have conditions and it may worst of all have even got um, penalties in it that if you, overstep these, these, um, these requirements of the license that you automatically accept the penalties that are built into that license. And this is happening around the world, so you do need to be careful with it. As soon as you step away from, from the well-known path, you need to be very careful. So there's a link to the um, OVR license chooser, the Creative Commons ones. Um, there's a link to how to mix the different licenses. This can get a bit confusing. So um, that's another detail, more detailed topic for another day. And um, yeah, you need to be careful with that. But I think there's some reasonable guidelines to follow through on it. We can talk about that when you have examples for me to, to think about. And this attribution, the TASL, title, author, source, and license. Um, there's a link to tell you how to do those. Everything should have those on. If in doubt, ask. There's a whole network of Creative Commons people. Um, many people around the world have done the license, so that uh, the certificate on the license, so that would help. Otherwise, um, you're sure to find enough information, and you can always go back to the IP owner as well. So long as, well, sometimes publishers I gather don't respond to you, but I'm sure an author will normally respond. People often ask me, how do we find how we are? Um, I'd suggest using the advanced Google search facilities, but once you find something using that, you do need to also um, check it thoroughly yourself because of the metadata missing it, Google search engine might find the wrong material. You do need to take care. Um, there's, of course, I've got my own search list. That's a bit of a rough uh, uh, search list you'll find on here. I'll update it from time to time. If you've got repositories I can put onto it, please let me know and I'll pop, up, pop it onto the list. Everybody and their dog and their pony has got their own list, so that's my, my list. Um, the University of Cape Town has a beautiful looking content finder. Um, these are, there are examples with some of the publishers like the Oasis one. Um, BC Campus is in British Columbia in Canada. They've got a nice list of open textbooks. And of course, OpenStax and Rice University have got a nice listing. There are lots of open textbooks that we can start to use and hopefully reduce the cost to students. Just a reminder, 
is we're doing this to try to equalize the playing field a bit. That's what I'm doing here. You might have a different perspective and that's fine. But this is what I'm trying to do is to, I'm trying to influence you to share more so that somebody else can benefit and make it um, easier. And this comic and the previous comic I can share with you in this um, slide presentation, but unfortunately because South African law being about 30 years old does not have fair use and so I cannot give it to you in the PDF. So that you'll find is missing. Um, the two blogs that I'm going to leave links with you on as well. This particular blog is on the Creative Commons blog site and it's something that I wrote and that they've accepted and that is, uh, is available to you. If you go into the direction of creating or updating an OER policy anywhere, um, I did this work with uh, an institution in Zambia earlier this year, everything online, and I found that the policy template that I downloaded from the Commonwealth of Learning was a bit out of date, so I updated it and they have now agreed to share the, the newer version. So there's a 0621 version which you can download as well. There's a link at the top of that page. This is the report that I mentioned at the early part of the presentation and you'll find the guidance note on OER. Essentially it says to every institution and to governments, please select a default open license and then select a way that you could um, alter it so that you can select a different license if necessary. You may want to select, for example, a CC BY SA license for normal use, but you might suddenly have a reason to put an NC or an ND onto the material. And so you need a method that's not too cumbersome to do that. The last part of my presentation, I'm just going to hopefully give you something that I think uh, we should try to work towards. In a different blog, um, I wrote about um, open learning websites and the one that I used here is to highlight the UK Open Learn site uh, run by the Open, Open University in the UK. And there's a whole lot of things that it offers. For example, you can access all of the course material without even having to log in. And that's in multiple formats. So think about that when you are using your OER website. Can the material be downloaded or is it restricted in some way? As a registered person on the site, still free of charge, I can do the test and I can get a statement of participation that's automated in your Moodle or whatever you use, Xanka or anything else. I can download the entire course material in a doc, PDF, Mobi and EPUB in the case of the UK one. And I can then modify and use it for my own students um, or community or whatever I'm, I'm working with. So that's what I can do on an open learning website. But maybe we can take this further. Um, this week, the Association of African Universities launched a, um, a learning management system for any institution in Africa to use. And it's free to the institution, but I know they have a, a little funding model so that each, each student who uh, uses it, the institution or somebody would need to pay for. And that's a wonderful start. But what I'd hope to see in the future, this is maybe a year or 10 years out, I don't know, but an open learning system that is national or regional, like Africa regional, can we then look at um, something where um, as a lecturer, we could log in and we could access tools that we might not otherwise be able to afford. Some of the tools are horrendously expensive and require annual subscriptions. And only if our institution is wealthy enough can we use them. But possibly a, an Africa-wide um, site could provide these sort of tools to anybody who could log in and use them. To facilitate materials development and online publishing, we don't all have the tools for this. So maybe a, a platform for the continent could do this. Ensure technical access at the lowest possible technical common denominator. This means that the person who's using that older 3G phone can still use it. That my iPhone 5 that's sitting on the desk next door to me right here, truly it is, that it can still use it. I get so sick of websites that say to me, you can't use my app because your telephone's too old. I don't like that because many other people across the continent suffer the same problems. Um, the same site 
could provide a basic set of services to institutions to offer digital badges and credits. I know a good, well-resourced institution can set this up for themselves, but we can't all do it. But maybe a, con a continent-wide platform could help many institutions to do this. I think there's, there's a demand for it, but it has to be done in some different way. Then to ensure integration with major qualification frameworks, South Africa is not the only country in Africa with a qualification framework now. So we should be able to always touch, find our touch points with those and to help with the pathways for learners as well. Um, I've been working quite a bit on employability in the, in the last two years. And I find this pathway to learning and the qualifications is an issue in all the countries I, I read up on or I work in. So we need something with that as well. But if we were to do something like this, then I would think that we could probably um, make a, a serious impact on the continent. I just need to get this thing to move forward. Oops, there we go. Um, so let's, let's imagine a, a platform for Africa, something that can help people at scale. And it's all very nice to get 30 people into a room but it's so much nicer if we could think of a million people at a time. Uh, I have great respect for, for Indy in that respect, in that I think the smallest number of people they ever deal with is about 2 million at a time. Um, and so if you think at that scale, you can, you can start to really make a difference in, in a bigger part of the world. Um, we could help with materials development and making sure that people can get access and we could work across multiple countries at a time to do this. As a couple of links, if you want to connect with Creative Commons, there's a contact link there to the um, Global HQ. There's the um, Global Network link, um, and also the link for the um, how to select and share your materials. And here is a page about the South African chapter, all of our various different links. Please do get involved. We actually are one of the bigger chapters around the world now. We've got about 50 people on our list. So please do join in. Uh, there's the necessary uh, licensing information about the, the uh, presentation. And this is me. And the QR code is my business card for you. So I'm going to.